so for me, uh, I remember actually, I remember being scared to drink because I knew I was gay, but I didn't know. I just didn't understand it because I came from a big family being gay and, and what I was attracted to, it was really confusing. So I did not want to be drunk in front of my friends. Mm. And then like, I didn't know what alcohol did to me yet. I was like 14, you know, 13, 14 year old thinking, well, I, if I drink, what if this comes out? What if I like, like make a pass at one of my friends or something? You know, once I became a pro skater and started touring, uh, my friends and I are smoking blunts and drinking beers in the tour van. And it, I never let it get too out of control because I always wanted to be a good pro skater. You know, I took pride in knowing when we were going on a tour that those kids were waiting all summer to see our demo and having Ed Templeton as my boss and my mentor and my peer was fantastic. You know, he knew that we weren't excessively drinking. He, we knew that we were never glamorizing it. It has been glamorized in skateboarding. Um, I never tried to glamorize it. For me, I used it in many ways. It was what we would call liquid stretch. My body was so sore and I could have two beers and not feel so much of the soreness in my knees and my ankles and my wrists. And then um, for me, it helped me dealing with all, you know, the pain of being gay and being in the closet and being on a tour with people, you know, having straight porn mag images around me. Luckily, I was with a group of people that weren't homophobic because Ed was such an artist, photographer, individual that you know, Ed was kind of the weird guy and, and we all respected him because he was, he was fun and he's vegan. He never touched a drink in his life and he knew, and he showed us like, you guys can enjoy yourselves. Just be respectful to people around you. And, uh, therefore we had like my first tour ever for the toy machine video. Welcome to hell. I felt safe. I felt very influenced by Ed's, uh, you know, his outlook on being a professional skateboarder he always said you know brian just do the best demo you can unless you're hurt and sign every autograph and enjoy yourself and i said thank you because here i am on my first ever skateboard tour as an amateur being in this video that's very high highly regarded welcome to hell toy machine and um so uh, that was pretty balanced at that point, at that time, my, my drinking, you know, um, you'd maybe, yeah, I'd have a couple in the afternoon to get my body feeling okay. And, um, then drink in the van on the way to the next city. I mean, you're, it's not luxurious. You're in a skateboard tour van, you know, you're in a Ford or Dodge, you know, 10 passenger, 16 passenger van, and that's your home. So, um, uh, yeah, we weren't rude to each other and Ed, you know, could sense that we were respectful to ourselves and to the fans. When did you start realizing that it was, or when did it start becoming an issue or something you wanted to stop doing? Um, in San Francisco, probably like I'm 45 now. So 15 years ago when I was between 25 and 30, I just drank more because I, around 25, I started coming out of the closet to friends and family. But that pain and confusion was so severe. And then being that alcohol, alcoholism is genetic, like my uncle and uh, probably my, my mother's relatives, I can't call them out exactly, but grandfathers, great grandparents like that, but major problems with alcohol growing up in the depression and in, in Maine, in the country, and, you know, there's just alcohol everywhere mm. and, you know, terrible different times. And, and, you know, in 1880s, you know, who knows, but, um, between 25 and 30, I drank more, um, just to, yeah, just because I was living out of a bag on and saying yes to every tour and loving it, having a lot of fun, but it's in, it's in my blood. It, it you know, it was, it was the thing that would make me it's also the other aspect is that uh 
I'm kind of a sponge emotionally. So when I'm in a room and there's all these other people experiencing joy and pain, I soak it all up really quickly. And it really, really can bring me really far down when I see someone around me struggling because I'm really sensitive. Mm. I'm very strong, I do believe, but I'm very sensitive. And you have five or six beers and I stop feeling everybody's pain in the room. My family calls me an empath. A lot of people use that word, but I guess it's a word I'm okay with. Uh, I'm very empathetic, mm. you know. And um, so alcohol, uh, I guess help isn't the correct word, but <laughs> I'll say it. It helped that at the time. It soothed that rather. And um, and then, but I, I would always go to the gym after a night of partying in San Francisco. I knew I wanted to stay good on my skateboard. I never wanted to embarrass myself out at a contest or out at the skate spots in the city. I wanted to excel. I wanted to skate good. So, and because I'm Norwegian, Irish, I could drink a lot. And I would also drink a lot of water and I would eat healthy and I would stretch. I have to, I'm six foot four. So, you know, I could take a lot. I could take a lot of pain. I could drink a lot of alcohol. And I also knew when to go home. I knew when to put my friends in a taxi. So I'm not trying to say that's responsible. Um, but uh, I was a full blown functioning alcoholic, hmm. if you want to call it functioning. But, uh, and then, not to shorten that story, but click to last year when I, before my 45th birthday in May, I just was very concerned about my poor organs after all those years, you know, and then not only my husband and my family, but, you know, just everyone and my body. I, I really th started apologizing to my body and at the same time thanking my body out loud and all my muscles and all my bones and my lungs and my veins for getting me through life and i said i owe you a favor to my body so it's like i had this massive conversation a year ago with my spirit and yeah my mind my heart and uh and i was addicted i was addicted i had to make sure i had a bottle of wine or more than a six pack with me when i went to sleep every night and i was like this sucks I'm addicted to alcohol. I have to know when the liquor store opens, you know. I have to know I have enough to get through the night to 10 a.m. to skate to the liquor store. And I was functioning, you know. I would have probably six drinks in me at all times. And uh, I could skate good. I could still call my mother and do all my emails. But then it, there were so many times publicly where it did get out of control. But... um that's skateboarding. That's rock and roll. You know, it's not cool. I don't think that's funny. I don't glamorize it, but I would be at an event and I wouldn't get that wasted drunk until I could tell that everybody was about there. You know, I would, I would keep my composure best I could because there'd be a lot of people that I call decoys that would be plastered <laughs> and, <laughs> and I'd feel for them. And I'd be like, yo, yo, you got to go to your room. <laughs> like, and it goes back to me being a, kind of a, a mom, you know, I, I really, that's my thing. Um, and that's why I say I don't crave fame. Uh, I, I just feel comfortable in that world of entertainment. And uh, I like to make sure everybody else is having a good time. I used to do what I called a wind down. I would buy a gallon of Crystal Geyser and dump a bunch of it out and pour like one and a half bottles of wine in it. And that would be all I could have for the day because my, I called it my levels, my, the alcohol in my body, I called it my levels. So I'd be out with my husband and I'd be like, hold on, babe, we're going to get on the train. I just got to get my levels right and I'm good. So I'd like pop into a bar. I'd grab like a glass of Cabernet, like a glass of red wine. I'd grab another one, finish it. I'd be like, cool, feel perfect. Not sweating, not shaking. And, um, so I just have this constant trickle, if you will, you know, like an IV. Um, and uh, so what I did was, yeah, I, I went from however many drinks I was having, you know, um, and it's not pretty, it's not cute, it's not a fun thing, uh, you know, uh, I'm not glamorizing this. I'll say that over and over and I don't care how many times I say it. But I was drinking a lot and I was also sweating a lot. Um, so I would get like two, three bottles of red wine and 
a bunch of white claws, you know, which we I call them like river beers. They're they're very low alcohol, you know, and I would still have a sandwich, some chips, a Gatorade, a banana, avocado, all this stuff, you know, here I am like being my own doctor. And um so what I did was I just yeah, I didn't actually feel any organ pains necessarily, but I was getting puffy. You know, I could see it. My face was red. Luckily, I didn't experience any jaundice yellowing of the whites of my eyes. You know, I didn't even have the gin blossom nose because I was active. But to answer your question, how did I go about it? Um, yeah, I just reduced my amount. So I would buy wine or beer. Uh, at some points, I was having vodka at the bar because it's hot out. I'd have like a vodka with pineapple and i knew my levels i knew my you know i'd like oh that's enough nope people be like i'll oh, do a shot hey i know that'll get me drunk i have to stay the way i am right even keel and um so yeah i just would put alcohol on the counter the bottles of wine whatever it was and then i just reduced it over a couple weeks and my husband could tell i was getting close and I could feel I was getting close, you know, the sweats and the DTs, the shaking stuff. I mean, I really probably should have gone to a hospital. And it's, you know, um, I'm sorry for people that are listening to this. I, I, I don't think everyone should be their own doctor, if you will, and do it the way I did. Um, it's not this it's it's not the safest way, but I strongly believe I know myself, so I'm not recommending anyone try it their own way you know if you're in really really deep please speak to a family member or someone or call and research and ask for help and you can wait and find a place if you have to do it with public assistance you know you there are places you can eventually get yourself checked into and if you're fortunate enough to have health insurance and things like that then you should go to a a, a center or rehab, you know? Um, but because I had so much experience stopping in the past, I knew that I had to s do it slowly. You can die, mm -hmm. you know, just like opiates, you know, you can die like people that quitting opiates, your body can have a stroke. So I was very slow at, at lowering the amount of alcohol every day. And I could feel it because I was in tune with my body. I was no longer, extremely drunk and i could tell that my body was ready and um i uh just i like a little bit of cannabis to slow to come down for like um my nerves but that also kind of makes me a little paranoid at this age in life earlier on i enjoyed that with my friends and eventually just I had a lot of meditation and tea. And that day on May 23rd in the morning, I knew I, I could tell my body was ready, you know. And also I take a lot of hot Epsom salt baths to sweat out all the poison during that process. And, and just mentally prepared myself too. I think I like to think when you're speaking with your spirit and really, you know, telling yourself we can get through this. I say we as in our body. You know, your mind is my mind talking to my body. That's just how I did it. I never, nobody recommended that. I didn't read it anywhere. It just naturally came to me. You know, I would lay in bed and, and like I said, I started apologizing and thanking my body at the same time for getting me to that point of, of jumping down these staircases and rolling and tumbling and smashing. And then, and then all the depression, you know, getting me through that and i said you know what i'm gonna do you a favor i'm not gonna do this anymore 